could turn to the book of Titus. Um, <clears throat> we're going. We're going through this. Um, I would say verse by verse, but it's more like word by word almost. Um, and I'm thinking what I'd like to do. I don't know. I don't know when when we'll do it. I'm either thinking uh, take a short break after chapter one, or it'll be Matthew at the end of Matthew. We'll take a break and we'll do uh, we'll do gap stuff. Yeah. So that should be fun. Hmm. No, I was listening to that because I had a two-hour drive. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. Whatever that is. I don't know. There there are a lot of misconceptions about that too, but we'll we'll deal with that when the time comes. Um the, that's another one of those that's just kinda kinda fun to to look at and we'll see how long it takes us to do that. Um <clears throat> Titus chapter one. We're going to start off in verse nine, and I'm going to read. I'm going to read through verse thirteen, and then we'll we'll get going after that. Um, so Titus chapter one, verse nine. And of course, we're we're on the heels here of of Paul laying out the um, the qualifications for a bishop or elder, uh, pastor, whatever you want to call it. Any any one of those, you could interchange any one of those. And you're still talking about the same same person. Um, <clears throat> so as we, we start off here in verse 9, the, one of the last things that he says about the qualifications, he says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word as we take a look at these passages. Uh, and how they, they uh, connect to the local church. May we, may we keep these things in mind and uh, come to a clear knowledge and understanding of what you're doing today in the dispensation of the grace of God. Um, and that we're mindful of that and allow your word to be the final authority in all things. Thank you for this day. We thank you for your word and we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> all right. So, a couple things that I want to do real quick. Um, we've talked about... Um, last couple times we've been dealing with that that phrasing there that Paul that Paul uses, um, holding fast, right? Um, and we talked about how that's different than standing fast. In fact, we talked about in order to hold fast to something, first you had to stand fast. Um, so in order to do this, we need to get that first. All right, you have to take a stand on something before you can hold on to it. Um, and so then as we go through this, down in front, quiet in the, quiet in the mezzanine, the upper level of our church needs to keep... No, I'm joking. Um, so the holding fast here, right? Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that, that we talked about... Um, go get go get Job chapter two real quick. Um, Job chapter two. We're actually going to get a couple passages in Job. So if you want to go ahead and get Job chapter two and Job chapter twenty seven, and uh, we'll get we'll get going from here. There's there is a slight difference, and we talked about that slight difference the last time. Um, but what is it that Paul tells Titus that they need to hold fast to, right? They're holding fast the what? All right. First, he says faithful word, right? And then a little bit later on, he talks about being able to exhort and gainsayers by 
sound doctrine. So what we find out is the faithful word and sound doctrine are one and the same. All right. So how is it that you're going to be able to exhort and convince the gainsayers by sound doctrine is you have to hold fast that faithful word. So there's a couple, there's a couple passages here or a couple verses here that I want us to, to see and hopefully, hopefully this will this will kind of shed some light on it to make sure that we, we know what we're doing as we're moving forward. Um, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at Job chapter 27 first. All right. Uh, so we've got Job chapter 2 and Job chapter 27. Right. And I didn't say which one to go to first. So that's my fault. Um, if you've not got that yet. So Job chapter 27. <clears throat> We're going to start here in, uh, let's start off here in verse verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul? All, all the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. Notice in verse 6, he says, My righteousness I hold fast. So what is it that he's holding fast here is what? His righteousness, right? And so then there's something that we can get from this as well. But notice what's he, what's he say. He says, my, my righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. All right, so we've talked about that there is a slight difference between holding fast and the standing fast. The standing fast is saying, this is what it is, and I'm not moving away from it, right? And we, we, we talked about that, and we've gone through some of the passages, and, and Paul tells, uh, tells us quite a few times, especially when he's going through the armor, right? In Ephesians chapter 6, what's one of the things he says? Having done all to stand, stand therefore, right? And what we have to do is be able to take the information, build up this doctrine in our soul that we might be able to stand on what we know. And we're not tossed to and fro, like he talks about a little bit earlier in Ephesians. So when we hear something or see something, our first thought process would be what? Does this match what the Bible says? And so, you know, Bruce had mentioned it earlier about how we have to be Bereans, right? And we've talked about that before, and you don't just say, okay, well, so-and-so says something, so I'm just going to believe it, because so-and-so said it, all right? <clears throat> but what happens is, it doesn't say, stand fast in what so-and-so said, all right? It's saying, stand fast in that doctrine, that sound doctrine, that faithful word. But here he's talking about, in Titus, about holding fast, so what do we notice here? About Job, he says, My righteousness I hold fast, and I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. So what's he say? What's he, what's he telling us that holding fast means is that he's not letting it go. Right? And that, we talked about that. We went through a whole bunch of verses, and we found out um, that that's, that's what he's dealing with there is you're not letting it go. Right? Um, standing fast is saying, here's the doctrine. I'm going to stand on what the doctrine is, and then the holding fast is, I'm not going to let somebody come and take it away from me. Right? So <clears throat> what happens is if somebody comes along and says, um, well, you don't have forgiveness because this, this, or this, and then you're like, you know what? You're convincing me, so I'm going to change my mind. You're no longer holding that, holding that, so you're no longer standing there. And that's happening. Um, and not just specifically that that issue, but you know that's one of those things that you, there's there's these things that run around all the time, and none of them's new. Um, you know, we we can go through and talk about all those things. But my main issue here is I want us to be able to see what is it what is it that he's talking about? He's holding fast. He's not letting it go. All right. So the issue there is don't let go of what the faithful word. All right. Why? Because that faithful word is that sound doctrine, and that's the thing that's going to help us to convince, to exhort and convince the gainsayers. All right? And we'll talk about those, those two terms here in a little bit. But go back to Job chapter 2. <clears throat> and I think, you know, we talked about this before. Um, 
and I think I think we'll see this as we go through. And you know, I don't think it would be like a big doctrinal issue that anybody would have a problem with. I, I, you know, as we're going through Titus chapter one, Paul says, "I want you to fix the things that's that's wanting, right? The things that are that they're lacking." Um, that doesn't mean that what they're lacking is the structure as far as you got to have a bishop and a deacon and this, this, and this. The structure is the stuff that we talked about before, the edification process, right? That's the structure that they're missing. And that edification process, what's going to happen is somebody's going to stand out and say, you know what, this stuff's true and it's working in me and I want to be able to do this. And he says, okay, now I'm going to ordain you as an elder. Does that make sense? The order comes from the function rather than the function coming from the order. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe. And we talked about it before, form follows function, right? So what happens is once the word starts working in you, then you're going to go and do whatever you need to do. And then whatever you're doing is just because you're doing the work, um, which is opposite. Um, most people, Most people are like, okay, I want to go start a church somewhere. In fact, I know a guy that does this, so I did this. So we're going to say, I want to go start a church somewhere. Um, and I'm going to get people to come out with me, and I'm just going to say, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. And somebody's going to send us money, and we're going to go do it. Right? Um, that's them creating some sort of form and saying, okay, we need to function through that form. Well, those people might not be qualified to perform those functions, right? So instead, what we do is, you're like, okay, we want to start a church. What do we do? Well, let's just meet together and start having Bible study and see what happens. And then things happen because we're doing the function, and that form comes after that. So the form is what? What we're doing here. Um, and that just comes out of the fact that we decided to meet, and that's what's happening. Um, because of this stuff that's taking place. But we see this, uh, we see this again. Notice in, in Job chapter 2, uh, we'll start reading in verse, verse 1 here. Uh, Job chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Now, this will be something we'll take a look at after... Titus chapter 1, after we're done with that, we take a break, or Matthew chapter 1. Um, we'll take a look at this. Notice, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. All right? So what we have here is there's, there's a, there's, it's, almost, it's almost like a, I, I kind of hate to say it this way, but it's almost like a board meeting, right? All the angels come to present themselves to God. And that's, that's what he's talking about. And then Satan shows up too. And it's almost, like I said, it's almost like a board meeting. Like, you know, what's going on? All the stuff. Not that God doesn't know. But, um, but that's the thing. And you see this. Notice verse 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? Now again, does, does God ask Satan that question because he doesn't know where he's been? Or is he... Or is it a question of accountability? He's saying, where have you been? Because I already know. Right? Now, the other thing with that, the flip side of that is, just because God knows, does that mean he's causing Satan to go and do and, and be where he's at? No. All right? So, we take a look at this and it says, And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking, and from walking up and down in it. Now, <clears throat> what I want you to think about in that context, and we're not really... This is kind of extra. Um, so where is Satan? Where was he? Well, he was in the earth, right? He's going to and from the earth, and he's doing what? He's walking it. Notice he says, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. We, we've mentioned this before. <clears throat> When, when God tells Abraham, says, I want you to go in, I want you to walk around that land, what's he doing? He's saying, I want you to show that you own it. Well, what's Satan doing by walking around on the earth? 
He's showing that I possess this. You know, when, when, and again, like I said, we'll talk about these in a, in a couple weeks or so. But I want you to think about this. When Jesus Christ is tempted by Satan on the mount or on, on the in the wilderness, and he says to he says to Jesus Christ, "Look at all these look at all these kingdoms that I own. They can be yours if you bow down to me." Does Jesus Christ say, "No, it, it's not yours." And so there's, there's some things that you need to consider uh, as we go through that. But notice in verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in, in the earth? Notice, a perfect and an upright man. All right. So if we take a look at this, what do we know about perfect? Does that mean that he was a sinless, perfect person and he just never, he was just the best guy you'll ever meet. Now he's talking about he's, a, he's an adult, right? Um, especially when it comes to uh, what he's going to talk about there. He's an adult. He knows some things. He understands some things. And he, ba- he, he lives and makes decisions based on, in, on, on the information that he has. Um, he's perfect and an upright man. Notice, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still, notice, he holdeth fast his integrity... Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Now notice what what we see here. The Lord is talking about Job and he says, He's a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and he, and still, he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. He's saying, even though you're, you're wanting me to do something... He says, what's, what's he doing? He's still holding fast his integrity. You know what that means? Even though, and this, this is at the very beginning, so this isn't even really when things have started happening to Job, but he's saying he's perfect and upright when it comes to the information that I've given him, and he's living the way that he's supposed to do based upon uh, the doctrine that he's given, and he's saying, and, he's, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. He's not going to move. All right, so there's two things that we see there. What's he holding? He's holding fast this, and by him holding fast, what's he doing? He's not going to be moved. All right, so we see those two things working together um, as we go through that stuff. So, if we go back to Titus, and that's just one example that we get to see. Uh, it's one example of Job uh, that we get to see how how those two words can kind of work together. Um, they're different, but they get to work together. <coughs> All right. <clears throat> so when we get back to Titus chapter 1, verse 9, he says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. So we, we kind of mentioned this a little bit. What do we notice about this? It ends in what? I-N-G. Now, I'm not an English major or anything like that, and I'm not going to pretend to be. Um, but if you're jumping... What does that mean that you are currently doing? You're, moving, you're jumping up and down. It's, it's a thing that's currently going on. If you said, well, I had jumped, what's that mean? Well, I jumped, but I'm no longer doing it, so that was a past thing. Or if you say, well, I'm going to jump, what's that mean? You're going to do that in the future. What, what this is, is this is a thing that is taking place currently. Right? So this is what he's looking for is somebody who is blameless, um, a steward of God, not given to wine, not soon angry, not a striker, not given filthy lucre, lover of hospitality, lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. And then the last thing is holding fast the faithful word. This is something that he has to currently be doing. Right. So if you think, <clears throat> if, and you think about this, and this is kind of scary, if churches, if boards said, we're going to look at our congregation and our pastor and see if he is currently holding fast the faithful word, you would have to have churches shut down. And they wouldn't even know it. So if they said, okay, we're going to go to Titus chapter 1, we're going to say, we're going to, we're going to take Titus chapter 1 and we're going to put that in motion. Because honestly, isn't that the point there? He's like, this is how a local church works. Second, or 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 says this is what's supposed to happen. Um, 
Joel Osteen would be out of a job. I mean, you think you can go through the list of all that. But notice, holding fast the faithful word is something currently that has to be taking place. And we talked about that faithful word is that same sound doctrine that we have in the second part of that verse. But notice, what's he say? Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. All right. So, what has to have taken place before holding fast and standing fast? You have to know something, right? You have to be taught something. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Paul's talking to Timothy here. He says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, and he continues on down. But what we notice there in verse 2 is what? He says, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses... Stuff that I taught you, Timothy. What I want you to do is take what? The same thing. Which means what? Don't change it. All right? And we already see this. We already see this in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. He's already told Timothy this, so this isn't anything new. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went in, into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and to and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. All right? So what do we see here? He's saying what? don't teach any other doctrine what I want you to do is take the same thing that you've been taught and go teach somebody else okay now with that does that mean whoops, <laughs> the, no I'm good. so does that mean that you are not allowed to think for yourself All he's saying is, what I want you to do is take the things that I've taught you, take the same thing, commit it to other people that's going to be able to teach the same thing. Um, and what's going to happen is, is what? You're going to understand the rest of the scriptures based off of that. If you don't start off here, then the result's not going to be the same, right? And here, here's the thing. We talked about this before. In 1 first, first, in first Corinthians chapter 2, uh, starting off in verse 10, we find out that, that the things that God hath prepared us, prepared for us at loving, He has revealed them to us, right? And so, as we go through that, we find out that the Holy Spirit teaches us comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He takes verse and verse, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. We... we what he does is he takes the information and teaches us through the scriptures, not supernaturally, here's information, here's all the knowledge that you're ever going to need, but what he does is he takes the information that we have and teaches us, hey, this verse goes with this verse, right? And what he's doing is he's taking this information, and what's going to happen is we're going to be able to take this sound doctrine and be able to study the word the way it's supposed to be studied. And that doesn't take our thought process out of it. But what we need to do is have that same foundation moving forward. And if you've got the same foundation moving forward, then you should be okay. Now, does that mean that that's always going to be the case? The answer is no. Right? Which is why you have Christian atheists, which doesn't exist. It's not even possible. You know, I was thinking about that the other day. Um, and I forget where I heard this, but... In order for you to be an atheist, in order to be able to say that God does not exist, you would have to know everything and be everywhere to say that God doesn't exist. 
which means you would have to be God. To be able to say that, because if you're not everywhere, where could God be? The one place that you're not. If, if, you, if you don't know everything, then where, what, what, what could we know about God is he might be in the place that you don't know anything about. Right, so to be able to say, you know, for somebody to say, well, I'm an atheist, that just, it's, it's, it's almost impossible because that means you would have to know everything and be everywhere. Um, but then to be able to take and say, well, I'm going to be a Christian atheist. I mean, if you take something impossible and then you take, an, I mean, you talk about an oxymoron. And just, it's more moron than oxy, Right. And, and, and unfortunately, that's what it comes down to. But I mean, to be able to say that I'm an atheist, that just for somebody to say that, they would have to be able to know and, and know everything and be everywhere to prove that God doesn't exist. Um, at least an agnostic, somebody says they're an agnostic, I can at least handle them. I can deal with that. But <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> Titus chapter 1. Verse 9 says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. So there's some things that we need to be taught, and what we do is we don't change the doctrine. We don't teach another doctrine, right? And he says that. Here's the purpose. Why is it that we need somebody that would hold fast to the faithful word, that he may be able by what? Sound doctrine, uh, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, we kind of talked about this before. Um, what's it mean to exhort? So if, 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 if we want to exhort somebody, what do we want to do? Well, we want to energize them, right? Um, um, you, you, you know, this is something that we need to know. This is something that we need to, we need to do. Uh, it's to use this information to incite people. Right? Excite people. Get people talking about this. Animate them. Get, get them to do something. Um, but what, what, what the best part is, is how is it that it's going to exhort people is it has to be what? Sound doctrine. It can't be feel-good stuff. Right? And that's why we talk about... I was talking to uh, my mom yesterday, and we were talking about the last election here in Kentucky where we got governor and all that stuff. And I told her, I said, had people, and of course, the last guy, he wasn't the best and perfect, but um, had people voted based on information rather than emotion, it would have been a different vote. All too often, we make decisions based on emotions. Um, and that's what happened. Everybody's just mad at one guy, so they're like, we're going to vote against you because we're mad at you. And that's honestly the only reason they voted. Um, and they probably had never voted in an election in the past 20 years or whatever. But what happens is we, 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 we put too much into emotions these days. And so what happens is this, this inciting or this exciting doesn't come from emotion. It comes from the sound doctrine. It's that, the, that he may be able to buy sound doctrine. The issue there is what? The sound doctrine. The sound doctrine is supposed to be able to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Well, what's it mean to convince somebody? Well, change their mind on something. Go real quick to Acts chapter 18. Um, Acts chapter 18, uh, let's take a look at number, uh, verse 24. Um, verse 24, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born, in, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught this, uh, diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him, uh, took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. All right? So what do, we, what do we notice there? What is it that Aquila and Priscilla are doing to Apollos is what? They're saying, you're missing some information, right? 
And so what they're doing is they expound, they, they, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Um, there's, there's a thing over in uh, 1 Thessalonians where Paul tells them, he says, I want to perfect that which is lacking in your faith. All right? And so then when you start thinking about these, this goes back to the perfect issue. What is it? They expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They're basically saying what? You don't have all the information. Here's the information. Now you can take that to Galatians chapter 2. And what do we find out in Galatians chapter 2? Paul goes to um, um, Jerusalem, right? He's talking to the um, Peter and the eleven and all that. And what's he do? He says... They taught me nothing, but contrary wise, I was able to teach them something. And so what he did is he expounded unto them the word of God, the way of God more perfectly. It's the same idea. He's saying, here's some information that you all don't know that you need to know. Well, we see the same thing here with Aquila and Priscilla. But notice, notice in verse 27. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the, the disciples to receive him who when he was come helped them much which he had delivered or believed through grace notice in verse 28 for he mightily convinced the Jews that and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ All right so what do we see here and, and and there's a whole bunch of stuff here that we can get and for time's sake we probably won't be able to but what do we have? So we've got Apollos. Oops. Apollos, right? Um, Apollos knows what? Verse 25, only the baptism of John. So Aquila and Priscilla come along. What does Aquila and Priscilla do? They take Apollos and say, hey, by the way, you're missing some information and we need to teach you some information. And they, they expound unto him the way of God more perfectly. What is it that Aquila and Priscilla do to, talk to, to Apollos? They taught him some stuff. All right. And so because they taught him some stuff, what was he then able to do in verse 27? And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, what did they write? Exhorting the disciples to, um, to receive him. So they're saying, they're, they're, they're saying, you all need to receive him. Who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace. Notice, for he mightily convinced them, or convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by what? The scriptures. So what is it that you think that Aquila and Priscilla taught him was the scriptures? So then what did he do? He was able to go and he mightily convinced the, the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. By what? By the scriptures. Did he go in and say, guys, I've got this, you know, Lord spoke to me. I've got a word, of the, word from the Lord for you. No. They said, Here, here's, the, here's the verses. And, and I, could almost, I could almost picture him here. He's saying, um, you see back here, this, this, this Old Testament passage, it says when Jesus Christ comes, when the Messiah shows up, this is what he's going to do. This is where he's going to be born. He's going to perform these miracles. He's going to do this, and he's going to do this, and he's going to do this. Well, we see it all over here. And this is all taking place. And what he's doing is saying, guys, we've missed something. The only thing that he knew was what? The baptism of John and then Aquila and Priscilla taught him something. And then he was able to do what? Mightily convince people. Not just people, but the Jews. That Jesus was the Christ. By what? The scriptures. So, when we think about that, that's the same thing we've got going on up here. The only difference is this sound doctrine. Where's the sound doctrine and the faithful word come from? It's from the scriptures, specifically rightly divided, right? And what do we do? We take the same thing that's been taught, and what, did, what is it that he was able to do? He was going to go and teach the exact same thing that he just learned. And what did he do? He mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures, Jesus was the Christ. It's not just like they're, it's not just they're like, 
yeah, I could see that. There, you know, it's almost like, wow, that, that is, there it is. Why, how did we miss this? You know how often, and I've done this before, you know how often people say, I've never seen that. You can almost picture them, that's what they're saying. We've had, we've had this, we've had the Bible for however long. I've never seen that. Why have I never seen that? Well, what did they have at that time that was almost, it was, it was as if they were hiding the truth from them? Well, they had the religious leaders. Right, because what were the religious leaders doing? We you go over to Romans chapter 9, you find out that they were doing what? They were going about trying to establish their own righteousness by doing things. Right? And what, what is it that God's always wanted is what? Faith. Just believe what His Word says. Um, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> and one of the and, and here's, here's my point. We'll see this as we go through this, hopefully. The, the idea that I want us to be able to see here is to be able to persuade people. Um, do we persuade people um, by how passionate that we are? Like, why don't you get this? What's the issue here? It's the book. How are we supposed to be able to exhort and convince people is what? Just teaching the scriptures. Show them the sound. It's the sound doctrine should be the issue. And we see this here. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll, we'll start, uh, start in verse 22. So again, this is Paul talking to Timothy and explaining some of the things to him. and um, Some wonderful things here. You know, Hymenaeus. You've got Hymenaeus and Philetus up there. And what do they do? They're teaching that, well, the resurrection has already taken place. So are they, have they changed the doctrine? They changed the doctrine, right? So, so we see that. But notice in verse, verse 22, it says, he, he's, talking to, he's talking to Timothy. It says, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, uh, with them that call on the Lord out of pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Have you all ever been asked, did Adam have a belly button? Have you ever been asked that? I've heard it. Yeah. That's an unlearned and foolish question. <laughs> you know, you think about those things. <clears throat> um, anyway, we can, we can go on all kinds of stuff. Anyway, let's, let's continue on. Verse 24. Um, and the servant of the Lord must not strive... But be gentle unto all men. That is hard to do. Um, that's, that's a tough thing to do is to be able to be gentle unto all men. But here's the best part. The gentleness, where does that come from? That's one of, those, that's one of the fruit of the Spirit, right? So what happens is, once we get in this book and we start studying it and things like that, the Bible, what, what, what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit's going to take that information. Uh, once we believe it and we store it up in our soul, He's going to say, this verse compares to this verse. Not audibly be able to do that, but you're going to be reading through it and be like, hey, I know a verse that just looks just like that, sounds just like that. And you're going to start learning some stuff. And what's going to do is the Word of God's going to work in and through you the way that God's designed it to work in and through us. And what it will do is produce gentleness. So that when we come across somebody that does come up with foolish and unlearned questions and we don't strive, we don't fight for it, that's the, that's the best part. But he says what? Be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Yeah. No. Do you want, do you want my, my answer? Um probably because they're not where they're supposed to be and the Spirit's not producing that in them yet. The Word's not. And here's, here's, here's the problem because you get into that. Um, and so Delilah's question for those that, that couldn't hear online is with a lot of the arguing, there's not a lot of gentleness. And the question would be, why is there not a lot of gentleness? Why is it striving? Why are they striving against each other? Um, it's not produced. But what, what the problem is, is, a lot of folks, 
the whole grace life issue that God will produce his life in us and that's that's one of the things we talked about last week right uh, there were five things five as aspects of edification um, one was the indwelling spirit right and what God does is he, he takes his life and, and pr puts it in us right he takes his life and puts it in you the moment you get saved his life the Word of God is also what? Um, Jesus Christ, John 6, 63 says what? The Word is, thy Word is what? Spirit and it is life. So when we think about, when we think about those, we looked at Hebrews 4 about it, the fact that it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? Piercing even to divide and sunder the soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And we're not naked in front of it. And it knows that it, it knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart. And it, the book reads us when we read the book. And we talked about that. But it's, again, his life in us. Right? And then you've got uh, the third thing we talked about was pastors and teachers. The communication of not just doctrine, but sound doctrine. Right? And that communication is uh, we take the life that we have in us and we share it. Which is why uh, Tom Bruchet asked me a couple years ago, what's the big difference that you see in teaching high school and teaching the Bible? And I told him, I said, when I go in and I teach, for instance, right now we're doing special right triangles, which is a byproduct of the Pythagorean theorem. When I'm going to school, what I'm giving my kids comes from here. When we're here, or when I go to the conference or something, I'm giving something from here. It's, it's a completely different thing. I'm giving of myself, just like you all give of yourselves. But when I'm in school teaching stuff, that's just head knowledge. But what this is, is I'm taking the information that, that's stored up in me and God's Word working in me, and I'm sharing that with you all. And it, it wears me out sometimes. Uh, it's different. I could teach six periods a day, geometry all day, which I do, and it not drag me down the way that this would. Because it's, that is just, just repetition. Here's this, there's, here's this head knowledge. But this is completely different. It's a communication of sound doctrine, where as it's working in and through us, that's what we do. So when we have conversations about this stuff, that's what we're doing, um, is we're communicating that sound doctrine. So if we have a conversation with somebody at work, that's what we're doing. It's a completely different thing than teaching mathematics. Math doesn't live and work through me the way that God's work, which is why this book is so important, which is why we care so much about the fact that we've got the Word. Uh, the fourth one, what? Should be. It, it, and honestly, it usually starts off, it probably starts off with good intentions. But, and because I've done it before, I know, I know, I've done it before. Me and uh, Jerry Porcy, we, we used to go around on that stuff. And I, I look back and I'm like, I was just stupid of me. I don't have a big head for it. Anyway, never mind. Um, yeah. A lot of, yeah, he's, yeah, he's still around. But I mean, I, we used to fuss all the time, back and forth, and I just got to the point, I'm like, yeah, 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 there's, there's a way to do it gently, um, but that's the difference. Some people, you know, you, and you can tell when somebody's being gentle and when somebody's not. Um, but that communication of that sound doctrine, the local church and the prayer, right? That, that's, that's one of those things. But if you're not teaching how God's word is designed to work in and through you and produce that grace in your life, you're not going to see it produced in your life. Because you're not believing that God's word is going to do that. And so then as you see that work out, then that changes. Over time it happens. Um, Ronnie and I have talked about this, and he said he's, he's changed as the years have gone by because years ago he just, he would, he would, and he told me, he's like, I would get upset if somebody doesn't understand right division. And I was the same way. 
And you just want to hit them upside the head and say, how can you not see this? It's plain as day, black and white on the piece of paper. Um, that's true. It's true. Um, but then you, you question, and it's not that you question their salvation. You just question, all right, if, if, you're, not, if you're not able to have a gentle conversation or try to convince people in a gentle manner, um, that's a fruit of the Spirit. And you notice there he says, uh, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Well, what's patience? Patience comes from what? That's a fruit of the Spirit, Right? And the app to teach is you have to be prepared to be able to teach it. Well, me saying, I'm right, you're wrong, that's not teaching something. And so I've, I've come to the conclusion, and I've not, it's still hard for me to do, is I almost, I'm almost thinking, and I've, I've said this before, but I don't really care if somebody teaches something wrong. Let's just teach the right thing, and then when you all see the wrong thing, you're like, well, that's wrong, and then you forget it. You move on. Um, and that's, that's the issue, but you will have to deal with people. And you notice in verse 25, notice, in meekness. Well, where does meekness come from? It's a fruit of the Spirit. Instructing those that, notice, oppose themselves. All right, so I want you to think about this real quick. A person... A person trusts in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ... They are what? Complete in Him. Um, they are circumcised. They are um, regenerated. They're indwelt by the Father, indwelt by the Son, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They're baptized by the Spirit into Christ and in living union with Christ, and they're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And all those, all those spiritual blessings that we've talked about is true for that person. That person, the moment they get saved... They're completely and totally forgiven of all sins forever. They are justified, glorified, sanctified, all that stuff automatically the moment that we get saved. Now, that's who you are. But notice what he says here. Verse 25, in meekness instructing those that what? Oppose themselves. Do you know what that is? Somebody that says, I'm not forgiven of all sins, I'm not sanctified, I'm not glorified, I'm not righteous, I'm not this, because look at all the junk that I do. And so what happens is, is when you see that he says, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, they don't understand who they are in Christ. So they're going to react as if they are not perfect in Christ. And again, it's complete, right? Not sinless perfection, all that stuff. But it's who we are in Christ. That's the issue. So he says, this is who you are. God says, this is who you are. And then what people do is they oppose who they are. Well, why do you think that they oppose who they are? Because they don't know who they are. And, you know, you talk to average person that goes to church. Um, you ask them, are you... Are you forgiven of all sins, past, present, and future? They'll say, no, because I've not forgiven everybody in my life. All right, so what they're doing is what? They're, they're calling up Matthew 6. But what do we know a little bit later on is Ephesians 4, and, or in Ephesians and Colossians, he says what? You are forgiven. So what do we need to show that person? You're, you're forgiven. Why don't you know this? No. What's he say? We, in, in what? Instruct them that oppose themselves. And what do we do? We show them the verse. Like, have you ever considered this? And they're not going to get it. How long did it take? <laughs> How long did it take when you first heard about right division? How long did it take before you actually got rid of all your other stuff? And some of us probably haven't yet. Right? Yeah, and we all do. And so then you look at some of these things, you're like, that's what the verse says. But how long did it take us to get to the point where we finally decided, you know what, I'm going to believe that verse no matter how I feel about my life. Like I said, some of us, we still struggle on some of those things, and that's okay. 
Do you know why? Because it's already true for you, whether you know it or not. But think of how much more liberty you have when you just get that off your back. You know, I, for years, I, I told Delilah, I said, for years I still listen to Andrew Womack and Kenneth Copeland and all that stuff, and I'm like, I'm not believing in healing, but I believe in divine health, and I'm going to be healed all the time, and I'm just going to be healthy all the time, no matter what. And that was the last thing that I had to let go of. But those are things, and I'm sure there's other things that I've not let go of yet, but that's the last of those previous doctrines that I learned that, was, that I had to let go of. There's other things that I have to deal with. But notice, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, they don't know who they are yet. So what do we do? We take the same thing that we've been taught and tell them, have you ever considered this verse and this verse? Well, I'm just a poor sinner saved by grace. That thing drives me crazy. Well, you're a saint of the Most High God. Let me show you some verses on it. That's what God looks at you as. Now, does that mean that you're not going to sin or you're going to be perfect and all that? No, that... That's the different issue. We are complete where? In Him. Because we're in Him, we're complete. We're not complete because we do stuff. We do stuff because we're complete. It's a completely different thing, right? And that's one of those issues as we get on through here. But notice he says, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So I want you to think about that real quick. <clears throat> What is it that's going to have to get them to change their mind? That's the repent, right? What is it that's got to get them to change their mind? Are you in charge of changing their mind? No. <laughs> Again, monkey off the back. Churches this morning, guys are standing in pulpits, fussing at their congregation, telling them, you're not doing this, and you're not doing this, and you're not doing this. Are you sure you're saved? And people will say that. They'll stand pulpits and do that. Well, so-and-so didn't sign up. You know, you got the, the signs in the back where they've got the uh, who will rob from God, and they got the, the names of the people that's not tithe. And then you've got, <clears throat> then you've got the guy standing up here saying, uh, we want you to do something. Why aren't you here? You know, you didn't sweep the floor this week. Why didn't you sweep the floor? And you, whatever it is, all that junk. That's not the issue. What do we get to do? And I've said this before. I was worried when I first started wanting to preach years ago. I was worried because I didn't know anything. I was worried. I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to yell at people. That's not who I am. I'm not, I don't want to tell people you have to do this, you can't do this. I'm not, I can't, that's not me. So then what do we get to do? Here's the words. You make a decision. The moment that I understood that, I'm like, that's going to make this a lot easier. And what happens is what? <clears throat> God's word working through them, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the knowledge and the truth, what do, you, what do they have to do? They have to acknowledge the truth. This is what it says. It's not up to us. The Word's going to do it. Notice in verse 26, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. If somebody doesn't understand, you know, when, when Paul says, If our gospel be hid, it be hid to those that... Who's, who's hiding the gospel? God of this world. So then, if you do, by chance, hear the gospel, what's the next thing that he's going to try and hide? Well, what's God's will? All men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So if you do mess around and you get saved, what's Satan going to do is what? Try to hide the truth from you. He's doing a pretty darn good bang-up job on that. By what? Other versions of the Bible. People 
not teaching who we are in Christ in the books of Romans through Philemon, people not understanding sound doctrine, people that are not teaching the same thing that Paul was, was teaching to Timothy, and they change those things. And I've, t- I've said this before, I feel bad for those people. Because you've got to perform every week. I think it's fun to be able to just read a verse and be like, there it is. <laughs> you know? Because it's 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 whether or not we choose to believe the verses on the page to the knowledge and the truth. Back to Titus chapter one. Titus chapter 1, um, verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought, which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Now, those two, those two verses there, and I've mentioned this before, <clears throat> what do we have? We have unruly people, right? We have what? Unruly people. Then you have what? Vain talkers. And then lastly you have what? Deceivers. Right? For there are many unruly and vain talk vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Um <coughs> Go real quick. Go back to go to Philippians chapter three. I'm going to look at those. Um, and like I said, we're going to we're going to mention something real quick on those two verses. I think it's kind of interesting. Philippians chapter three. Uh, start off in verse one. It says, "Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord." To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, uh, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more than he talks about why he should be um, more confident in the flesh. But then he says, well, I count all that stuff for dung because the faith of Christ down there in verse, verse 9. All right? But notice, <clears throat> he says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Um, and notice, here's the issue. He says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the, in, in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Um, that circumcision that he's talking about there is what? Is he talking about the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter 2, what the nation of Israel had? And the answer is no. That, that circumcision is back over in Colossians chapter 2. So Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. We've looked at this verse. We've mentioned this verse, but we've not gone through it yet. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. And you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That's different than the circumcision made with hands. This is a completely different circumcision. It's one made without hands in putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And then he says what? Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Um, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So what's he talking about there? That circumcision goes along with what? The baptism that we have in Romans chapter 6. And if we allow somebody to put water in there, you know what, I, I heard a 
when we were down at Mom's yesterday, Delilah ran into Walmart, and I was listening to the uh, local Christian radio station down in Somerset, and they were playing a song, and the name of the song was There's No Power in the Water. Then why do it? It's a good question. There's no power in the water. Why do it? The, the song goes on to say, but there's power in the blood. Do you know what the blood does? When we, when, we, when we trust what Christ did for us, that he shed his blood for us, for our sins, what that does is gives us a circumcision that hands can't perform. It's the operation of God. It's the faith. Notice he says, uh, through the faith of the operation of God. The operation is God's, and we just believe it, right? It's the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So what happens is that baptism that we have coincides with the circumcision that we have here, and those two things go together. Neither one of those have a hand involved at all. Notice that it's without hands. It's the operation of God. God's the one that does it. God's the one. The Holy Spirit's the one that baptizes us, takes us, and places us into living union with Christ. So that's that circumcision that he's talking about over there. That's why he says we're the circumcision. Right? But we don't, we don't want to pay attention to everybody else um, because we've got, we've got some other things we've got to take care of. Right? Titus chapter 1. The unruly... Vain talkers and deceivers. Now, I've mentioned this before. If you look at verse 11, <clears throat> verse 10 and verse 11, he's got a, a set of threes, right? And the first one in verse 11 is what? They do what? They subvert whole houses. Second one, they what? Teach things they ought not, right? And then what's the third one? For filthy lucre's sake. Now, <clears throat> is it possible that all three of these people are doing all three of those? Yes, but um, I see them matching up this way, but is it possible that unruly also teach things they ought not and also do it for filthy lucre's sake? Yeah. And is it possible that vain talkers also subvert whole houses, teach things they ought not and do it for filthy lucre's sake? Yeah. Is it possible that deceivers subvert whole houses, teach things they ought not and all that? And the answer is yes. I find it very fascinating that he's got a group of three and a group of three. Well, when you look at these, what's it mean to be unruly? Well, the idea there is that they're what? Disorderly. They're, they're not subject to some rule. What is it that Titus is going to have to deal with in Crete is what? What's the very first thing Paul says in verse 5? I left you at Crete to do what? Set things in order. Things are out of order. That's what unruly people produce. And what happens is, and we've said this before, you go to a church. Is there structure there? Do they have people in positions? Do they have movie nights? Do they have this thing? Do they have somebody doing all this stuff? And again, every time I think of this, I go back to that episode on King of the Hill. I don't know why I do, but... They have a structure. So is the structure the issue? No. What is it that they're, they're unruly in? What is it that they're disorderly in is what? The sound doctrine. And we'll see that. Um, go to 1 Timothy chapter 1 real quick. <clears throat> 1 
First Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> um, start off in verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers and fathers and murderers of mothers, uh, for men slayers. So what do we notice here? What's the, what's the law for? Unruly people. Unruly people. Um, lawless, disobedient, un ungodly uh, sinners, unholy, profane. He goes on through there. So what was the law for was unruly people. What is, when you give that law and you use it lawfully, what happens to an unruly person is they figure out, you know, I can't do it. That was the, pur the purpose of the law was never to say you can do, you can't do. It's to say you can't do it. So when we see this, you've got these people who are not, they don't feel subject to the rule. What? What? About the law? Yeah. How it wasn't to you do this, you don't do this, because you'll never be able to do any of it. Right? That was the purpose of the law, is to show that you can't do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When you go, to, you go to Romans 3, and that's what he's talking about. We know that all Jews and Gentiles are under sin because none of you can do it. Yeah. So I may have said it differently. but So you've got this disorder that's going on, right? This, this unruliness, if you want to put it that way, that's going on. And what does that do? It subverts whole households. Then it's what? People that teach things that they ought not. Should we teach people to go and give a sacrifice. No. Most every church will admit, no, we don't do that. Um, but they'll say, well, we've got a tithe. They ought not teach that. They'll say, well, you have to ask for forgiveness every, every week or every day. Don't, you're not supposed to teach that. So they're teaching things that they ought not. So their unruliness, and they're doing it for money, their unruliness is what? It's not in the order of how they do things. It's the structure in which they're teaching. So it's the sound doctrine is the issue. I mean, we've, we've, we've mentioned this, I don't know how many times, but we're not here to build big buildings, build a movement, build some machine, build up me or anybody else. Our goal is to what? Get in the book and find out what the book says. And let that be the issue in all things. And then what happens is we don't have that unruliness because we're holding fast to that sound doctrine. All right, you've got vain talkers. What's it mean to be a vain talker? If something's vain, it's what? Empty, useless. So vain talkers, what are, what are vain talkers able to do? Well, subvert whole houses, teach things that they ought not, and for filthy lucre's sake. Um, but I'm thinking it's more vain talkers or what? Teaching things they ought not. Because it's worthless for them to be able to, or useless for them to be able to teach those things. Um, we'll go through these a little bit more. Um, deceivers. What about deceivers? What does it mean to be a deceiver? You purposely say the wrong things. Now, really what happens is... Um, The goal, really the goal of all these is to what? Move you away from who you are in Christ by promising you some physical ecstasy, right? Think of it this way. What do you mean you've not been baptized? It felt wonderful coming up out of that water. You just cannot, you can't imagine how it felt. Feels just like the bathtub, that's right. It feels just like the shower. You're wet. That's all it's got in you. But what do they do? They're like, oh man, you just you've never been baptized. You you just don't know what it's like to just you just I just felt I just felt wonderful coming up out of that water. So then what do they do? There's some physical I felt good when I did this. That's what these people are doing. 
And they're trying to move you away from who you are in Christ by saying you're missing something because you've not felt like this before. You mean you've not had the Holy Spirit come on you and you're just hooting and hollering and hosting Lashonda and all that junk? And like you just, you just never, you just, I felt like a warm feeling inside. It, you, I can't explain. It just, I felt good. Do what? Fuzzy? Ooh, the warm fuzzies. Mmm, I felt good. Didn't you just feel the spirit this morning in church? Oh, I just, I just felt this warm feeling. You know, all that, all that stuff. Yeah, speaking. To, you've never spoken tongues before, man. It just, just to have the Holy Spirit just take over my body and use it to to do. And that's what they're doing. They're reaching for some physical thing. And they say, see, that proves. And you know what they're doing? You know what they end up doing with that? You've never experienced that like I have. What's wrong with you? I'm more saved than you are. I'm more spiritual than you are. God's doing work with me that he's not going to do. And that's what they're doing. Do you know what that does? It puffs you up. And do you know what every one of those things are doing? Unruly, vain talkers and deceivers. Do you know what they do? They try to move you away from who you are in Christ. By some promise of some physical ecstasy. Like you just You can't explain how good it felt. So then if you're not grounded and if you're not standing fast and holding fast, what's possible is that you're what? Going to believe that and be like, well, maybe I need to go to this church and run through the aisles. Maybe it is pretty good. If you're not there, if you don't have that stuff, it's easy to do that. Um, and so we, we see some of these things and, and <clears throat> there's some verses that, that I want to be able to go through with this. We'll talk about it. But that's the idea. They try to seduce you into thinking that you're missing something. And it could be as simple as, you mean you don't take clothes to this shelter and do and, and, and live the gospel? You know, it popped up on my timeline um, a couple days ago from a year ago. I posted on Facebook. I said to my denominational friends, can you tell me what it means to live the gospel? Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart and, and soul and all this. All right. Okay, what does that mean? Well, you've you got to do good. All right, what's that mean? Well, it's just, you know, living the gospel. you got, you got to treat people the right way. What is that you know what living the gospel is? You go over to Galatians, you find out what living the gospel is, is telling people they're not under the law. You know what the law does? It says do. Do you know what the opposite of all those people is saying? That's living the gospel. Living the gospel is not here's a checklist, go do it. Living the gospel is allowing God's word to work in and through you and understanding that you're going to stand fast and hold fast to that faithful word, that sound doctrine, allow that to be the issue, to be the motivation. Not the external junk that everybody else looks at. You look at most quote unquote Christian movies, they're they're promoting some mythical, mystical, you just can't know God until a certain situation in your life arises, then you can experience him. That's not what it is. You've got a book in front of you. That's how he talks to us. It's not through issues in life. It's that book. What happens is what God wants us to be able to do is take the book and use it in those issues in life. Not the other way around. Not have some issue in life like, I wonder what God's trying to teach me here, so I'm going to just flip through the Bible and find something that speaks. That's not the issue. The way you do this is you get the sound doctrine. You stand fast on it. You hold fast on it. You don't let somebody come and move you off that. And you don't let somebody come and take that away from you. You understand who you are in Christ and allow that to be the issue every day. And then when something happens in life, you're thinking, well, I'm still in Christ and all the things that were true yesterday when this thing didn't happen is still true for me today. And it doesn't matter that this issue's come in my life. I know that I'm not out of some sort of fellowship with God. 
And that's what they'll do. It's, it's a, <clears throat> when things in life happen, we know there are things that happen in life. They're not some secret message. Like when somebody says, I got a check in the mail for $300 because I made a mistake on, I don't know, name it. Mm -hmm. I overpaid on my insurance, I overpaid on my taxes. Got a check in the mail for $300 that I wasn't expecting. God is good. Yeah. So if you didn't get the check, he's not so good? Yeah. And anyway, that's just money that already belonged to you. That, yeah. Because there's so much of that God is good. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm no longer sick. God is good. Yeah. There's a... No, and, and I'm, I'm the same way. It's the, uh, God is good. He's good all the time. You say that now. Two minutes ago, you were cursing, cursing him like, what? you know, all, you were a Job, you were a friend of Job, is what you were <laughs> five minutes ago. And then you get this in the mail, and you're like, yeah, God's good all the time. You just, you just, uh, we was talking about a lady that mom worked with. It's the same thing. Um, her idea that the reason that she was always healthy is because she was perfect and anybody that got sick is because they weren't perfect. They had some sin. What's that same thing? Like, Based on whatever's happening, eh, that's, not the way, that's not the way it was designed to work. Um, and as, as we go through there, you know, we're looking at some of these things, the unruly, the people that disregard the, the, that, that rule or whatever it is. What's the rule? Write the divide. What do they don't do? They don't write the divide. They're a Hymenus and Philetus, right? Uh, that's, that's, that's who they are. Um, you've got vain talkers, people that just say things just to say things. Then you've got deceivers, people who are purposely trying to get you moved away. And everyone want to work towards something to say, well, you're missing something because you don't have this in your life. Um, there are some verses we're going to take a look at um, on those because I, I think it's really interesting to be able to see that stuff. Um, but we'll see what we do when we get there. All right. So we'll take a look a little bit more about how those work together and see if we can get moving through chapter 1. Um, questions, comments, concerns? Big issue is, is Fast. Don't let go. There's a song that keeps going through my mind every time I say that, and I can't think of what it is. Anyway. All right. So, thank you all for being here today. Folks online, thank you. And uh, we'll finish off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to have to study your word. Uh, maybe open our hearts and ears and study the things that we've gone over today, find out whether or not those things be so, and allow your word to be the final authority and allow it to direct um, our thoughts as we take it and believe it and allow you to use your word exactly the way that you've designed it to work. Uh, to the praise and honor and glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, it's in his name we pray. Amen.